Welcome to the Gottesdienst Crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Goddess Teens Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today we have back with us Adam Kuntz. He's a professor of New Testament at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. He does some stuff for Goddess Teens and then for a podcast called A Word Fitly Spoken. Welcome back, Adam. Hey, good to be with you. So you gave presentation for the November Fest, the Goddess Teens Conference here in Central Illinois to replace the defunct pastors conference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we were we were undefunct. It was yeah, good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And so you presented about persecution and the first half of your presentation you focused on the from the perspective of the pu- persecutors, right? Right. And one of the answers when Christians were brought in and they were always asked for their name, you know, just comply, do what you're told. When they were asked for their name, they always answered, I am Christian or I am a Christian, Christiana sum in Latin. Mm -hmm. Right. And that got me thinking uh, in light of the uh, gospel reading for the fourth Sunday of Advent when John the Baptist is questioned about who he is and how he doesn't answer. And then when he finally answers positively, he quotes the Bible on who he is. And I was curious about why or what things kind of have led to this type of thinking in modern Christianity in general, and perhaps in Lutheranism or LCMS Lutheranism in particular, that when we are asked who we are or what we stand for or why aren't you doing this or why are you doing that, our typical response isn't, I'm a Lutheran or I'm Christian uh, or we quote a Bible passage. We kind of hem and haw and circle around the issue instead of just really kind of standing firm. So I wanted to kind of explore that I guess that lack of understanding and identity. I know identity is a huge watchword these days, mm-hmm. but uh, what things in, say, the history of Christianity or the history of the LCMS in particular have kind of led us away from fully identifying as Lutheran and Christian and how we interact with the world? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that there is there is an overwhelming condition of life in in the earliest years of Christianity that has never been present in the history <laughs> of the LCMS, uh, although it's coming back. And that is that the line, the primary line in life, is between being a Christian or not being a Christian. Mm-hmm. Now that that line, I think, is there in the lives of a lot of our people. It is certainly not there in the lo- in the lives of most of our clergy. Mm. Our clergy live and and have certainly since 1847 defined over against other forms of Christianity, mm. and when. They're in an environment that is not specifically Christian. Let's say it's like campus ministry or something, and um, they might define themselves over against other forms of organized religion, which still concerns questions that are relatively easy, sort of home ballpark questions like, how do you believe that you go to heaven? Mm -hmm. The problem that we have, I think, understanding the things that I talked about in November um, and those people and their capacity for survival (laughs) is that you don't have time or opportunity. And so you also don't really have necessity to have the levels of detail in people's reactions to persecution in the early church that we do when we're trying to say, well, this is why we're not Baptists. 
or this is why we're not Roman Catholics, or even this is why we're not Muslims. Uh, yeah. The line, be, because the line about what you're going to need to defend and how you'll how quickly you'll need to react is drawn by the persecutor. That's that's why I started in the way that I did and then talked about the persecuted in the second hour of that presentation, because I want to stress that we're not dealing with either in early Christianity or in our own day situations that are theologically familiar to us. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> so like uh, a lot of the confusion about how to handle COVID and how to react to COVID and stuff like that is because we're accustomed to congregations being divided along theologically familiar lines that have largely to do with knowledge of the Bible, knowledge of the confessions, knowledge of Lutheran history. And so, you know, kind of conservative LCMS people have made a very concerted good effort over the past several decades to, for instance, get a copy of the Book of Concord into the hands of the laity so that they can be better informed and just mm -hmm. see that no one ever envisioned, you know, um, a Lutheran church running solely on, you know, praise and worship music. No one right. that just that's not going to it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. It's just it's never <laughs> happened. It's not going to happen. You know, and so, you know, we could we could bring in lessons from the 19th century about that. That was that was a known entity. And it's not that that battle was easy. It's simply that it was framed in terms that even other Lutheran church bodies in America had already gone through. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, OK, so the, the problem here is that COVID COVID is more like for pastors and congregations as groups is more like what a lot of our people have been going through in school, um, in the workplace for a long time, but we haven't really been talking about it mm -hmm. or we haven't maybe known how to talk about it. And that is a situation much more like you have a fight or flight response. So it's not yeah. that you're in a marketplace and then you say, this is what we're offering in the American religious marketplace which everyone agrees is open and fine and you can pick and you can be a Baptist or not go to church or you should be a confessional Lutheran. It's more like what you get. Um, uh, are you are you a Christian? Well, does that mean that you you hate me and, and your office is not a safe space? Well, now your question is, what do I say? Because I don't want to get fired, but I also don't want to deny Christ. And you didn't go into work that day thinking, hey, today I could get fired because I still haven't put up the rainbow flag that HR gave me to put on, you know, the, the, the window of my office to show that this is a safe space, right? And I didn't yes. pick this battle and this battle got forced on me, but here I am. And early Christianity operates in that environment. Yeah. Nothing so is hospitable. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying on the whole and for the most part, in at least in recent memory, Christians have been able to choose their battles, and yeah, not and, and the, yeah, and the battles have the battles have been have been not even so much Christian battles most often as they've been confessional battles yeah. inside or, or inside at least a cultural context of Christianity. So, mm -hmm. I mean, i i think I think one index of this change, which I very much like, is you know, the, the little, um, paper copies of the small catechism that you can get from CPH, mm -hmm. uh, say on the outside now, a simple explanation of Christianity, because I'm not defending, I mean, I, I could be in any given individual case, but if the cops show up to my church and my church is still open and it's not supposed to be open or whatever by like, commandment of Gavin Newsom or, or whatever. I don't know the yeah. governor of, you know, Phil Murphy in New Jersey. The cop doesn't care about Lutheranism specifically. He might not have any idea what that is. He wants to know why my church is open. And I can say, well, my church is open because I'm a Christian. Um, Cause this is what Christians do. <laughs> this is what Christians do. I'm sorry. Like you're going to have to kill Christians if you want the churches to be closed and to stop being public health threats, because we have to do this because we're Christians. And that's not only, you know, reducing confusion by not going into here's this denomination. That's sure. There's like a, 
there's just a wisdom about not spelling out every theological difference we have with say the ELCA just at that moment. Mm-hmm. Right. With, you know, their church is closed. We're open. It's, it's, yeah. it's also saying, realizing that those occasions that persecution is not an occasion quite like the line between us and the Southern Baptists. And I, yeah. I recently reread uh, the, the Augsburg confession and the apology and you know, the lines that Melanchthon is drawing, he, he's not actually saying, you know, he's not actually saying here are our denominational differences with what will come to be called Roman Catholics. Mm-hmm. He's saying that the, that if they don't forsake the things that are being done under quote, papal slavery, faith will be extinguished. Right. Right. So I think that persecution is an occasion either for the strengthening or for the extinction of faith. And that's why I'm perfectly comfortable simply saying I'm a Christian. Yeah. So, so is there another wrench that has been thrown into this just in terms of how easy it's been for us to operate as Lutherans or Christians in the United States? Yeah. That we've been, um, really able to get along with the world, so to speak, or with the secular world, yeah. um, that, that, uh, that that line between secular and holy is, has been kind of dissolving as well. Yeah. And I think that that is very confusing to people because it makes them unable to see certain things that if they, if they thought of and I think it's getting easier to see these things because you see how people behave and how irrational they are. I think that a lot of Lutherans thought of and were taught by their pastors to think of everything that wasn't in church as sort of up for grabs. <laughs> and we can we can lament that it changes or something, or we can even notice that it changes, but we really have nothing to say about that. Oh, yeah. And so I think that our articulation of what has become called two kingdoms plays into our capacity to recognize when people that don't go to church are behaving in very religious ways. Yes. This is this is now so much easier because we say, you know, I mean, if someone comes into really any church that I go to, uh, either regularly or traveling or whatever, uh, and they see that I'm not wearing a mask, well, then, okay, um, why do your disciples live with unmasked faces, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the question, because yeah. now we can see that, quote, being secular is really just religiosity of a different kind, and they have their own, they have many and multiplying and mutually contradictory purity laws. Yeah, it it was a lot harder to see that ten years ago, let alone forty years ago. So I think ten years ago or forty years ago, it just felt like that whole realm was up for grabs, was kind of neutral, and it was obviously the source of the many of the advantages, especially the wealth that American churches enjoyed. And so it seemed like you know it, it's something that we needed to negotiate, but something we could live with. Yeah, there's a yeah. So, so I mean. How much then is does nostalgia for what was continue to play or wreak havoc on how we understand things now? Yeah, nostal- nostalgia has been horrible um, b- because um, it makes even effective thought and action sound kind of like it's it's an exercise in you know being like a civil war reenactor. And I think people think that about the liturgy, then they've always thought that about the liturgy. But I think they also think it about like you're LARPing. Yeah, you're LARPing. Like you you're you're trying you're trying to go back and the presumption in all of our heads, whether we like it or not, is that forward movement in time, like the clock moving, means that we're going somehow directionally forward, therefore you can't go back to anything. So if it's from the past, there's always something sort of wrong with it. Mm. Okay. And that's, and, and so, you know, if you're doing something that's kind of old, you feel sort of guilty about it in a certain way, or you feel the need to, I mean, just look at some of our bulletins. We're always explaining things. Why do we do that? Right. Mm -hmm. There are lots of, there are lots of places where there are complex rituals, 
that no one explains. I mean, no one, when you go into a baseball stadium, no one says, here's the infield fly rule. Here are the gestures uh, that will help you determine uh, how that's going to play out when it does occur. And this is the year in which the infield fly rule was put forth in Major League Baseball. And no one does that, even though it could have a lot to do with what you're about to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we spend all this time explaining what we do. And I think we partly do that because we feel awkward about it because we all feel like it's not really contemporary. I mean, think about the fact that that's the adjective that everyone ended up using for what wasn't our heritage. Yeah. <laughs> right. As if you, you know, however you're in, I think you're in your forties, you know, you're, you're doing the liturgy, you're doing this stuff. Uh, you're there, you're live, it's Sunday, you're going to do it next Sunday, that's in the future, but you're going to be there doing it. And somehow that's not contemporary. Well, the reason that the reason that it feels like it's not is because it feels like if you're moving into the future, then you're farther you away from the past. Yeah, you yeah, should leave that yeah. stuff behind. Yeah, yeah, that's from the past. So I think that that really limits our sense of what is possible, right? And that's why like when people see, you know, Americans snitching on each other for COVID violations. The reason they're shocked is because they think that certain things are just in the past, including persecution of Christians. It's just, yeah. it, it's back there. So, uh, I mean, what are sort of the things that have arisen within Christianity and in within our own heritage that it has made it easier for us to go along with the the not christian mm. than to stand i mean are in other words you know if we are and maybe you don't agree with aristotle but if we are you know the habits that we you know that we make and we get in the habit of always going along what are some of those things that kind of eroded that identity besides the fact that we didn't have necessarily, at least outwardly looking, a government that was trying to extinguish us. Yeah, I, I think um, the thing that has perhaps hurt us the most was the idea in our church that our relationship to the rest of society, really broadly speaking, including political structures and financial structures, was somehow... Um, a neutral matter, um, yeah. and and not even not even neutral because not even discussed. Ergo, probably our people have never heard a sermon addressing um, the imposition of certain moral norms by human resources where they work, mm -hmm. even though that's been a reality for many of them, maybe for their whole careers. Or we don't really discuss, you know. Um, what, it, what does it do to our sense of trust when we mostly consume news media and we don't know anything about the Bible? Well, I mean, COVID has shown us what happens when, when that's the case. Yes. So I think the idea that all of that was somehow neutral and what we were here in America to do was to live in sort of our own, uh, really in its own way, a ghetto that would be defined by certain structures that would mean a lot to each of us, but nothing to other people, such as the Lutheran school system, the colleges, the seminaries that no one else even knows about. Mm -hmm. um, just this whole parallel world that we would have that is permitted to us to have, and that could be retained. Uh, and then what we would need to negotiate throughout our own history would not be how do we handle the difficulties that our people actually live with, whether it's, you know, uh, increasingly we, we have tenant farmers in kind of our heartland congregations. Uh, it's harder and harder for them to own everything mm -hmm. that they have. And if they do, they're always in debt necessarily. Yeah. That's not how their great grandfathers farmed. So how does that matter? Those kinds of things are just kind of like left undiscussed. Mm -hmm. um, and, I think that that is really hurting us right now because it doesn't give, it gives our people something that is very commendable in us, which is a very strong sense of being LCMS, being Lutheran. Okay. Just the label, whatever yeah. other content that has, that's great. 
what it didn't give them was it were means of survival. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they, they don't do everything right, but the thing that I think the Amish thought about was not just that they want to be Amish, but also how, like what means are they going to employ to continue being that? And that is, I think what we have to start thinking about even on the level of just kind of memorized verbal formulae, like I am Christian that the early church is obviously using so that people have some training that when you're taken into custody, this is what you say, and this will unite you with the other Christians who are there. And then you guys will all stay together psychologically, which will enable you to stay together theologically because you'll maintain the confession and so on and so on. So those kind of both practical discussion of the difficulties combined with practical discussion of solutions is not something that I think we ever forced ourselves to come up with. Yeah. So, and so those practical matters are addressing the HR requirements on top of all of the, are you going to be connected to the internet or (laughs) yeah, (laughs) uh, are you going to have air in your tires? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) That, that kind of, I, I, it's, I'm trying to be funny, but yeah, no, but I, and, and, and it is, and it is funny and, you know, we're certainly allowed to make fun of other people for having silly discussions, but, um, every, every group is going to have stupid obsessions and silly discussions. So the question is, will those generally move in the direction of getting more of your children to, to be part of the church when they are themselves adults uh, and therefore reproducing the church, uh, or are those going to be moved in the direction of things that our people don't even really understand usually, Mm -hmm. and, and thus are neither really building up the church nor tearing it down. And that is that they come to be revealed as sort of trivialities in a time of crisis. Um, and I, I don't, I just, I, I don't think we have time exactly to focus on tri- on triviality. So let me give you an example of that so that you know people understand what I'm saying. I don't really find that I have time to tell someone who's trying to be Lutheran Church Missouri Synod pastor parishioner or whatever in 2021 how or why open communion is wrong. The time <laughs> to have right. leisure to debate Whether you're going to, you know, the equivalent of walking into a McDonald's and all they're offering is Whoppers, like that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're an LCMS church and you're doing open communion and you're doing whatever other weird stuff, why are you wasting your time? Go somewhere else or realize that that's going to destroy you because it gives people no reason to belong here. Like I. I, I it, so it's not that I think that nothing theologically significant has been discussed during the the fat years that we have just obviously exited in so many ways. Mm-hmm. It's that those 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 discussions descent from basics, yeah, was a luxury, and that that that's going away. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I guess. You know, having grown up in the luxury, <laughs> the, the, the 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 time of Luxor, um, it's kind of difficult to actually wrap your head around. So, is this discussion going to be uh, with your elders and you know your parishioners from the pulpit and in Bible class? Yeah. Um, hey, we're Lutheran, so that means that we go to Lutheran schools. Um, does that mean? Uh, I, I guess like brass tacks, yeah. actual implementation, because it's been so long since that was the case. <laughs> like, right. I, I don't think anyone in their living memory may, I, I mean, I'm, I just had a 98 year old die and then she uh-huh. taught in public school her whole life. Uh, she's a lovely woman, but yeah. um you know what does that so what does that look like in terms of is this going to be something like to be a member you're going to have to sign that this is what you're gonna do? Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, no that 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 makes plenty of sense. <laughs> I I I think I think that um, 
that that might be a place that we go is yeah. is is just utter clarity such as <laughs> such as we once had um yeah. honestly about attending parochial school right right okay but notice that it was just about attending parochial school Right. Um, the rest of it was sort of cultural. So culturally, you can find mention in lots of early Missouri Synod things about uh, the problem of, uh, you know, people being cheated in business. And this discussion got as far as Walther trying to maintain that the charging of interest was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of slapped down by the men essentially in his congregation and saying, I'm sorry, this is just the way the world works. We can't, we, we cannot function without the charging of interest that that would be true in Germany as well as America. But I like the fact that they had that debate. Yeah. I think that what this means on brass tacks is, you know, maybe eventually you get as a congregation or optimally, this would just become part of being LCMS is part of being LCMS is, your kids just as kind of a rule, unwritten or written, I really don't care. Your kids don't have smartphones. They just yeah. don't have them because it's going to destroy them or it's at least going to make a lot of problems the kid doesn't need to have. They just don't have smartphones or mm -hmm. we don't have smartphones or whatever it takes. I mean, the point here is you, you have to begin to talk about things that we're not accustomed to talking about. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. I think you're on to, I mean, even to the extent of, um, you know, we don't need each other anymore because we all have our private insurance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I mean, you still have in, you know, I'm in a smaller community and you still have this sense that, you know, if a farmer gets sick, everyone else is going to pitch in and get his crops in. So you yeah. still have some of that, but that's not Christian. That's just farmers. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And so so it seems as though there are lots of things that were were decisions that were made. Well, let me did we fall into the insurance decision and some of these other things or did we make that decision uh with the discussion and say yeah, we're going to move that direction and then do it. I think on on practical things such as it, such as insurance um, such as banking, um, such as birth control, the thing that you find almost unanimously is that there's a diversity of opinion within the church at some point, yeah. um, because not even the St. Louis faculty in the 19th century could just rule on everything. So there's some diversity of opinion. It may or may not actually get debated. Uh, and then eventually it gets resolved from the church's perspective in silence. And I think that's why these things are, that's why they're corrosive. They're not yeah. even corrosive because I can sit here and tell you right now, the charging of interest is always wrong and we never should have done it and it's going to destroy everything. And it did and blah, 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 blah. I, I am not speaking from on high in that matter in any mm -hmm. regard. I'm saying that the thing that is corrosive is that we never talked about it really much. And that, and now we don't talk about it at all. Even though, for example, the fact that our young people can't really form families that can be stable long term and invest in a parish has something to do with our financial system, which they are expected to participate in totally individually, yeah. rather than with the backing of the church, which has made it possible for us to have pastors in lots of places because we've maintained legal rights and informally financial assistance to pastors to make sure that we can still house them. Why yeah. shouldn't we do that for everybody? Yeah. So that's an example where if we were talking about this, that would be something that we might be able to come up with, even just a single congregation. Since we're not talking about it, everyone except pastors just has to fend for himself in our financial system and our housing market. And, you know, that's just the way the world works, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's a common retort when some of these things are even brought up Yeah, as a dismissive. Right? Just to say, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> we're we're going to remain, we're, we're not going to rule on this. And then that's a ruling. So that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that is, that is such a, and the, I don't, I don't know where this comes from. It definitely doesn't exist in early Christianity. They, they are, they are not fatalistic as we are where things just seem to sort of happen to us and it becomes a collective problem. The vaccine mandates and potential mandates and whatever is a good, very recent example of this. It kind of happens to a bunch of us. Then the best that we're able to do collectively is to say, you know, optimally, like, it's okay, regardless of what you do, we're not going to kick you out of the LCMS if you're unvaccinated or something. I mean, Mm -hmm. I guess... Like right now, because, hey, like not enough governors have said that you need to be. I don't I don't know what it's going to take. Right. So the problem is we're kind of agreeing not to really discuss that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really know what to do about it. And, And the reason that I think about stuff like this is because I think that I mean, just if you've ever had someone come out back from vacation or visiting relatives and they went to another church and even the smallest thing was different. You know, Mm -hmm. the way they collect the offering, much less the way that the liturgy was conducted or whatever, that is legitimately confusing to people. And I don't think we should despise small confusions of Christian people. Those are those are worth addressing. How much more large confusions, such as how are my kids going to be raised in the church and especially in rural communities? I want them to stay here. I would love them to stay here and invest in this congregation, yeah. not move to, you know, in Indiana, it's like Indianapolis, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, th- that's like the only place that's growing in Indiana in the past 10 years. I don't want them to move there. I want them to stay in this, you know, town of 8,000. How do we do that? And you don't have to just, I mean, before you just decide, oh, that's the way the world works. Well, we just, we're going to have to get, we're going to have to require vaccination to go to church or the way the world works, my kids are going to move away. Well, why don't you see if there's anything you could do before you just say, that's the way the world works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is a yeah. total, um, I mean, it's a total indifference to what's going, I, I, and I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you get the same thing with the smartphones or mm-hmm. other other such things. Like, well, this is this is just how the world works. Right. Yeah. And I I think that that is maybe a result of an overwhelming amount of change or a a certain pace of change that makes people feel as if they, you know, they don't know what's going on or they have no control and everything. And, and there, there might be an anthropological point here that would be helpful to remember with, which, you know, if you're listening to this, you probably believe that it's good for people to have repetition in their worship every week, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, of a greater or lesser degree. OK, so, um, you know, I, I would love it if Redeemer Fort Wayne just did Healy Willen setting, you know, every week. Uh, mm-hmm. We're currently doing setting three from LSB. That's about as much variation as I enjoy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> repetition is good. Why is repetition that's only good? in penitential seasons? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, we we yeah we yeah it, going into LSB is is penance um, at Redeemer. So um, you know you know that's take that home and think about that. Um, that's why he's so l- well liked at the <laughs> seminary, right? That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Repetition is good for human beings because human beings are built for patterns. Mm -hmm. When those patterns are disrupted, and especially when someone goes from, this is the way the world worked when I was 10 years old, to, okay, it's different when I'm 40, and okay, it's really different when I'm 70, that that needs to be reckoned with by anyone that has any kind of fruitful authority over that person, Mm -hmm. including his pastor, and to take that into account, I think not. So the same principle that would lead you to say, I'm not going to mess with the service constantly. We're going to do this and we're going to do it well because we know that it produces Lutherans. Well, why wouldn't we do that with the other patterns in people's lives? Mm-hmm. Make it as easy as possible for them to follow the stable ways of life that were able to produce and reproduce faithful Christians in previous generations. That doesn't mean that I say to myself, hey, I'm just going to dominate my local housing market for the benefit of my church. Now, if you want to all get like the four real estate licenses that are necessary to do that in your rural area, yeah. I say go for it, you know? Yeah. Why not? But even if you can't do that, 
why not try to do something for each other that would enable us to propagate the faith? Um, Because I think that one thing that is sort of maybe a bad idea people have about the early martyrs is that the early martyrs are essentially um, engaged in these climactic moments, and that's what grows the church. Mm -hmm. There are other things in the martyr accounts to recognize about the nature of, of these churches that are under these kinds of intense stress. And the thing that comes up even more often than, uh, you know, that one, one person or many people die in a given account is the amount of solidarity exercised by the living and the survivors with not only the bodies of those who have given their lives for the sake of Christ, but also with those who survive. So people that are tortured and then released or people that, you know, they attempt to kill or interrogate, but are then released the confessors. Mm -hmm. All of those people are venerated because it builds up the body to go through the stress and then to come through it on the other side. Yeah. So we don't have to say today, you know, uh, you know, Pastor Broughton is going to face death in three years' time because he lives in Illinois. We don't we don't have to <laughs> prophesy that, right? right. Um, we <laughs> we don't have to. Um, what we can say is that it's obviously good for any any part of the body of Christ to go through things together and therefore to think and to plan together, rather than just letting anything that could happen happen to you, and then you figure out how to pick up the pieces. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when we were opening back up against the orders and, um, you know, my elders said, well, we'll make sure we have cash to get you out of jail, pastor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, you, you love to hear that. You yeah. love to hear that, that spirit, you know, like we're going to do this because we believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, that is wonderful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Th- th- uh, th- there were, Definitely. I mean, I spoke to way too many lawyers during that th- th- those early days <laughs> yeah. than than I care to. But um, that was probably one of the most encouraging times of my ministry in terms of th- th- the desire of the people to say, "We just need to get back in church." Yeah, and you know, to hell with what anyone else is saying. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Basically, I mean, they're quite <laughs> right. those curves, right? But, uh, uh, and that was super encouraging. Um, right. Because it's very easy when, you know, when you see the same people every week, but then you see the people that leave to think that yeah. everyone's on the cusp of that, right? Right. Right. And I, I think that those situations of risk are, are always fruitful when used properly, right? So mm-hmm. I think that this is this is something probably to stress now more than ever is that being alive entails risk. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Like like the concept of being safe as your primary value in daily life is not natural. Uh, it's not good. It's very unmanly. In the sense that uh, safety will not build strength, pain and sacrifice build strength of various kinds. Mm-hmm. So risk is necessary. It is part of life. I mean, without sin, we would still, you know, be risking ventures in taking dominion over the earth. There would be things that we would need to do that could go a variety of ways, yeah. even without sin. You know, so that idea. Uh, should be seen, risk should be seen as an opportunity rather than something to be avoided at all costs. And uh, I think this is something, I mean, you know, lawyers can be extremely helpful people. I think the idea of being completely insulated from risk financially, legally, et cetera, always means that you're playing inside the rules that have been set up by people who don't believe in the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. And a Christian simply can't live within those risk parameters. Yeah. All right. So, so what do you do? You know, since we're all out of practice with, you know, that kind of living, and we're so far removed from drawing the lines um, between Christian and non-Christian, and are very used to the inter- 
denominational kind of confessional yeah. um, line drawing. How do you handle the older members who still remember how awesome it was, you know, back in the fifties, say, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you handle those folks that just kind of want to, it's almost like they, let's just keep doing this because I'm towards the end and I don't want to go through something messy. Right. And the, and so the youngers who are perhaps maybe too zealous for their own good. Uh, I mean, can I say it <laughs> yeah, that Yeah, I way? know a couple like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so how does that interaction play out? Is there any sense uh, within the early church and the persecutions that they faced? Is there any sense on how they handled it or how that was passed on yeah. uh, to future generations? And what, I mean, what can we learn from that? I mean, yeah, the steps forward yeah. for us. I think that, I think that w- the, the most concrete example you could bring up, especially for older folks, is you know not to you know push and say like, well, the fifties weren't that great and blah blah blah. Much of which could be true. I mean, the fifties produced the sixties produced. The, I mean, like yeah. we got here somehow. So yeah. <laughs> maybe but the golden 50s times was the blip, not the ordinary thing. Yes, exactly right. And yeah. but you know you don't even have to say that because you have the example of Polycarp who dies in his late eighties <laughs> and whose, whose way of saying the reason I'm going through this is because Christ has always been a good master to me. Why mm. would I betray him? I think concepts of loyalty and betrayal have to come up. We're, we're not talking about theologically complex or difficult to understand things. It is a betrayal of Christ not to have the people of God assembled to receive the things of God. Mm-hmm. We, we, we have to be loyal to him. He is loyal to us. Okay? Right. He is faithful. So he is calling us to faithfulness to him. So um, you don't have to you know, say like things are different or, or you don't understand or the times that you lived through weren't really the way that you're thinking about them. All you have to say is, this is a test of our loyalty to Christ. Yeah. Has Jesus been good to you? Obviously he has. <laughs> You're here. You believe, right? And that's not, and they're going to have to figure out what good to them means. And yeah. what it means is that they actually believe. I mean, I think one thing to recognize here is the clarity that potential persecution and even death produces in people, even just when they have cancer diagnoses, what actually matters. Well, the fact that I believe in Jesus Christ and not otherwise, that matters. So I'm willing to give things up for that. So, I mean, it is a, it's a test for everybody. You can't, you can't say even to, you know, a 74 year old, it's okay. You can just coast like not, (laughs) there are no other, yeah, you're on autopilot for the rest of your life. You're fine. You've reached a certain age. That's not the way that Christianity works. To the younger, I think it's the same thing, but I think rather than letting, it, because a thing I see, especially in men younger than myself, is an enormous amount of anger. Yeah, because they they realize what what how they have been lied to, what has been done. I mean, we've all been born since mm-hmm. it was okay for our mothers to kill us. I mean, it's it is kind of a hell world in a yeah. in a way that seventy year olds, yeah. Yeah, Didn't it's, have to go through. it's. I mean, it's the difference between you know red pilled and black pilled, right? Is, is right the, the terminology. Yeah, but uh, I think yeah, and but I mean, I think I think being depressed or even being enraged constantly, it, it's not that I don't understand that. It's that I don't think it's productive. Yeah, for good decision making. Okay. <laughs> right, yes. Okay. That that's that's the point is that hatred of evil is good. That's a good thing. And the guys are right to have it. They're right to try to avoid evil in ways that their elders often don't even foresee they need to. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, for the sake of the kind of decision making about the ho- the local housing market and how we're gonna, you know, avoid difficulties with the law and so 
hatred and rage and and everything that kind of sweeps you away in the moment, it's simply not productive. So I at least have to bracket it. Yeah. Right. In mm. order to make, okay, hey, let's all get real estate licenses or whatever it is that we decided we're going to do in order to plan well, I need a certain amount of calm. And that is also a test of my loyalty to Christ because Christ maybe doesn't want a bunch of soldiers who are simply trigger happy, right? Maybe he wants some people who are able to plan better for the future and make complex battle plans and then carry them out with relative calm. Maybe that's going to be necessary too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to the, uh, so to the pastor, I I think this is going to have to, since the laity are already enduring it, and many of us clergy members are kind of quarantined from it, right? We don't, we don't live in their world. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and it's easy for us to say certain things. Um, what should we be preaching about to help um, kind of form the consciences of of those who are actually dealing with it on a daily basis. Right. I mean, I think you have to know and then discuss in your preaching and your teaching, your newsletters, the things that are occurring in their lives. So this is where, okay, um, it, it could be the case that something that you can see the Missouri Synod decided at a certain point to respond to um, a lot constantly was millennialism. Um, Mm -hmm. and that, that, that is, um, that's a big deal for certain segments. It's obviously a bigger deal if you serve in the South than if you serve in New Hampshire. Um, and we decided to have a concerted response to that such that LCMS pastors are in my experience, your mileage may vary pretty reliable on, you know, not (laughs) saying, yeah, not saying incredibly insane things about the end times, generally speaking. Okay. Just hedging all my bets right there. Yeah. Um, and, on and the that, whole and for the most part. Yeah, on the whole and for the most part, we're mostly doing a pretty good job, I think, for 55% of us. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But you know that that's definitely something where that wasn't an enormous issue at one point, um, especially in German as much. It became really big with the advent of televangelism. And we chose to respond to that. You can see it in kind of your pre-prepared Bible studies. It's there. We have some response to that. I think that there are a lot of things that are going to vary widely uh, by your member's occupation, um, by their investment in the public school system, by a lot of factors. But, you know, you want to keep those in mind. You want to know what those are. There are a lot of things that we just haven't been talking about. I think that challenges to conscience, not just not just new media consumption habits, their phone, everything that needs to be discussed, but also, um, you know, this challenge in your job, this, you know, and, and it's it's not we're not even just talking about soccer on Sunday mornings. We're saying, like, is it OK if your kid goes to school so that he can play high school basketball? But in almost all of his classes now, by virtue of state curriculum, your child is taught that he is metaphysically evil for a reason having to do with his race and not with the fact that he's a sinner. So he's basically being taught a whole different doctrine of sin and redemption right. than you're teaching him in church, like pretty explicitly at this point. Yes. So, you know, these are things that you have to discuss. I understand that makes people uncomfortable the thing is, I don't think that our sermons were designed to make people uncomfortable because we accuse them of sins that they don't commit or don't have to deal with, yeah. which is often how the preaching of the law sounds in our sermons. It's like, yeah. you're just awful. You're horrible. It's okay. Jesus isn't. Why don't you talk about things that they actually are tempted by? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you do that, maybe you could not only diagnose things, but also provide some help right. for their lives. You know, yes. Okay, so um, you know the things that I run into, uh, particularly. So I, you know, I homeschool. We, mm-hmm. my wife and I, homeschool, and we're in a small rural community, and so we were already weird. 
because of that. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It, not to mention, I mean, I, we don't have a huge family, but by today's standards, it's big. Right. And um, and so then we were weird again. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you know, I am a clergy person, so then yeah. it's like uber weird. Uh, I mean, despite the fact that you know I comb my hair and you know shave and things like that, <laughs> and I'm not like super, you know, I don't watch Star Trek. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's this is a line I shall not cross. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, well, you know, you know the, you know, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't have I to do. end off on my license plates or something I, like that. No, I'm familiar with the type. Yes, yeah. Um, I don't have a bowler or a monocle. I don't walk around with. Okay, a cane. hey, I, te- I teach at the seminary. It's getting a little personal now, so let's just <laughs> let's stop these descriptions and let's get to yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the difficulty is, so how how do you approach that so that they actually listen to you? I mean, obviously you can't make them listen, right? But so that so that you can actually have a productive conversation on some of those really important topics when you're seen as weird and an outsider yeah. and and it's an accusation of something that is so close and dear to their hearts like their community school right that's yeah. i mean that's one of the things yeah. that you know it just in my i've been here 12 years and i'm constantly kind of it, it's been a constant i'm okay, I'm able to add one more chink. It's like I'm throwing pebbles Mm -hmm. at a huge stone wall. And, um, you know, there's a part of me that's like, well, let's just demolish the wall. And then I think, I don't think I can do that. And them keep listening to me. Right. Yeah. And, and, and patience is always the teacher's chief virtue. Yeah. Because it, it requires, and it, because it requires not only, um, being able to wait, but it also requires love. Right. while you're waiting yeah and that yeah. you still love them even though you're still waiting um yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i think i mean at least a couple of things on that i mean one one is that um the, the the mere fact of people being you know different in the way that they're living their lives is again not something that in many cases different generations had to deal with mm-hmm. because difference couldn't be produced as widely um, and variously as it as it is by the internet, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't have the kid in the rural public school who is a practicing Odinist. You can have that now because of the <laughs> right. internet. And so there's a sense in which some of these problems will lessen, I think, a great deal over time because people simply have to deal with a great deal more weirdness and so your own personal, you know, I'm a pastor and I homeschool and I have a million children, or that's the number they always yeah. use when they talk about it, that, that, that dissipates over time. Yeah. I think all, but I think also from, from your own perspective, this is for me, part of the adventure of being a pastor mm-hmm. is that. I get to try to become a Jew to the Jews and a Greek to the Greeks. Yeah. That I'm not, I'm not waiting for them to be like, you're right, pastor. Classical education is the best. (laughs) You know, like I don't need to wait until that day. That's never going to come anyway. Yeah. I can. Yeah. Yeah. There is a, I mean, there is a sense that, um, you know, I kind of like being weird. Uh, <laughs> there you I go. mean, yeah. So you're on the clergy uh, roster. So I mean, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I went to Fort Wayne. So right. I guess. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But uh, but there is a sense that you know. So in our family, we have this common phrase, which is like, "Well, if that's normal, be weird." <laughs> and um, and there's a lot of right. That's normal. Be weird nowadays. Right. Yeah. Um. So so I. I you know, I'm not uncomfortable in my skin, but I'm just, I'm always cognizant of the fact that I am an outsider. Yeah. Right? It's like, right. so it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always feel like I'm one sermon away from not having a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, life entails risk. I mean, I, I think, no, I think, I think it is good. It is good. Not, not all conformity is actually even productive. Yeah. let alone good, it wouldn't even work even if you tried it. 
my oldest son was, um, you know, he played, he played little league, um, this past year. I was the coach. Um, he was probably the only kid that didn't have a phone with him, at least some of the time. This is Mm -hmm. the oldest kid is like maybe 12 on his team. And he was definitely the only one who didn't really know anything about video games. (laughs) Okay. But I said, it sounds like my kids. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it, it's like, you know, I, I have never sat him down with like a, you know, Jack Chick tract and like explained to him why video games were like invented by Masons to, you know, destroy our lives or something. <laughs> it's just not something that we do. There are other things to do with your time. That's why you're the best pitcher on the team because you've been working on your pitching. Right. These other kids are going home and playing video games and then coming to baseball practice. Yeah. So, you know, just the, the, the explanation and that not everything in life is, yeah, it's a matter of prudential judgment, but guess what? We're trying to make better decisions than a lot of people and that's okay. Yeah. And that can be seen over time. I mean, I think these collective decision-making processes where and when these are actually already occurring in our congregations, it's opening up space for people to then also consider, okay, is this actually what I want to do in my own individual life? Yeah. Yeah. It's not talking about any of this stuff ever at all, especially from the pulpit, that makes us unable to discuss not only what would be to our collective benefit, but even what would be to our individual benefit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, I don't know. I think I don't have anything further. Do you have any final thoughts about the whole range of topics? I I love that we're having this discussion because this is a discussion that I I wanted Lutherans to have when I came from the Episcopal Church, which is the line between belief and unbelief, uh, <laughs> many moons ago now. Uh, because the things that you notice are different about the Lutheran Church. Uh, the Lutheran Church doesn't, in some cases, tell you are different. So mm-hmm. just kind of a general respect for pastors that we didn't have in the Episcopal Church, even though our priests are paid much better than LCMS Mm -hmm. pastors, on average, just a respect for, okay, the pastor said something and it was from the Bible. It's, you know, that's amazing. That's really amazing. And so I think that discussion about these very kind of practical, how are we going to make decisions? How are we going to get people to form families and to Mm -hmm. live here and to invest? These are the discussions discussions we needed to be having a long yeah. time ago. So I'm really grateful not only for today, but for I'm I'm very hopeful that people are thinking about these things. Yeah. And that increasingly they will because this is how we survive. Yeah, it's very easy, I think, to uh, particularly in perhaps LCMS clergy to be very negative right. instead of just really kind of happy warriors. Right. Like, just understanding that this is what your this is actually what your task is and go about it with a certain amount of flair and joy yeah right well i mean why wouldn't you i mean you get you're alive right now god has decided to put you here this is the best place for you to be so go for it yeah exactly well good well thanks for your time adam and yeah uh, my pleasure and uh if we have something else that pops into my head because i'm talking to peterson then uh, I'll be sure to reach out. Okay, that sounds great. Take care. Bye.